marketize them based on the root causes they have. And once they have the root causes, uh, we have figured out the root causes, we try to come up with a defense that takes away those root causes as well as those bugs. So this is a generally uh, a good workflow for the kind of research I've been doing. Now, there are exceptions to it. In many cases, I've done work where we are trying to build uh, secure by construction systems. So, but the, for the purpose of this talk, let's assume this is the, uh, this is the workflow we are gonna follow. Now to go a little bit more, so there are various current uh, research projects that my group is uh, focusing on. Uh, so starting from the uh, bottom left corner, so starting with uh, SSL TLS security, which is uh, one of the most uh, famous cryptographic protocol that I'm reasoning about it, how to deploy them securely is what we are focusing on. Then there are aspects of automatic regulatory compliance checking is that if you have an information system, how would you check whether uh, your information system is handling private data in a regulatory compliant way? Then we have uh, authentication. So authentication here are both machine to machine and human to machine. Uh, the other line of work uh, that I've currently started pursuing is IoT systems, especially the automation platforms, such as the home automation and the industrial automation platform. So how can we uh, bring in security and privacy mechanisms retrospectively? Because most of these systems are developed without uh, security in mind. The other interesting project that we started working, uh, which is funded by DARPA, uh, uh, is building resilient system by design. So what do I mean by this is that uh, the prem premise is that uh, bugs would be there. So are there ways that systems can evolve even in the presence of bar bugs so that it degrades its functionality or performance uh, gradually? I mean, not drastically. And then uh, I have done some work uh, also in cellular network security and privacy. And this is what I'm gonna talk about today. So feel free to interrupt me if you have questions in the middle. So uh, Harley, if you could uh, interrupt me if there is a question in the chat, I would appreciate that. Sure, yeah, no problem. I'm paying attention to that as well as the YouTube chat as well, so. Okay, perfect. Now, one of the things uh, that is the focus of the uh, talk is mobile systems. So mobile systems, uh, it's actually had a lot of applications. Keep doing banking, uh, enjoying media, like uh, also navigating and other, other things, and as well as communication with your friends and family. Now, think about a situation if somebody could come back and take one of your uh, credit card information out, that would be bad. Now, this can be done in many cases due to bad apps, bad operating system design, or say network security vulnerabilities. We are particularly gonna focus on the network aspect, especially attacks that coming from cellular networks. So the first question uh, is, what is the adversary's goal in these attacks? So because it's a attack, it's most likely gonna be violating some security and privacy properties that people expect from the cellular networks. Now, what would be some examples of those? Say for, let's take security. An example would be disrupting the service or connectivity uh, or impersonating a device uh, to the network or impersonating a network, being a network to a device as well as overbilling and underbilling. So using the cell phone service without uh, actually paying for it, for example. And there are many other exam examples of such attacks. For privacy, uh, an example would be location tra tracking. So this is under the assumption that uh, humans always carry their phone. So if you can uh, locate the device, this is essentially locating the human uh, owning the device, as well as uh, intercepting the call and SMS, because you could, a lot of cases uh, we use SMS as a two-factor authentication. If somebody can intercept that SMS, they can take over your account. And then uh, for, Cellular networks uh, have a bunch of persistent uh, identifiers that uniquely identify either the device in question or the SIM card or the subscriber. Now, if you leak this uh, identifier, 
it has really bad uh, implication. For instance, it, it is often the first step to carrying out other attacks like location tracking. So if you have heard about uh, stingrays, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to uh, leak one of the persistent identifier uh, of the device. And then there are many different examples. Now, cell network attacks are pretty potent. Uh, and due to the fact that an attacker can carry this attack over the air. So this means uh, the attacker does not need to be adjacent to the victim. Uh, and this equipment that you need for uh, carrying out these attacks are not expensive. So this is actually one of our test beds, which cost around, except the computers, just the, the other equipment cost around $4,000. And you would uh, use open source protocol stack and software defined radios to actually build such a test bed. Now, the other thing is that uh, to carry out this attack, uh, attacker does not require the victim to install a malicious app. So there is no dependency on that. And after the attack, there isn't a lot of evidence that are left behind unless you somehow switch on the logging, which is not on by default. And finally, uh, users are oblivious to these attacks because they cannot differentiate between an attack and a benign network disruption. So even when an attack is going on, for a user, they would think it's just a benign network disruption, okay? So do this attack actually appear in practice? So let's take a, a case uh, from 2018 where the uh, device owners received this emergency alert that there was an incoming uh, ballistic missile in uh, Hawaii. And so this was actually a mistake by an operator pressing a wrong button. But we were able to show that uh, one can actually do send these emergency alerts uh, maliciously without a lot of trouble. Say for instance, the presidential alerts that, that were sent out can actually be faked very easily. It's not very complicated. Now, there are uh, many different cases that you'd see attacks in 5G or 4G popping up, but these are not uh, always uh, in the field or in the wild. These are researchers coming up with different attacks. Now, if you have heard about cellular network attacks, you have heard about stingrays. So there are uh, cases where Homeland Security have found evidence that uh, there are stingrays, which are, think of them as uh, devices, uh, fake base stations that try to pretend uh, to be legitimate base stations for, uh, and then lure the victim uh, in and then leaks one of the persistent ID. Then you can go on and uh, uh, carry it on the monitoring of the user. And the same thing happens in uh, other places too. Okay, so now that I have motivated that uh, solar network attack are potent and they do happen in real life. Uh, before moving on, I would like to talk a little bit about the background. So after I talk about the background, uh, we are gonna, uh, I'm gonna talk about a 5G reasoner, which is a analysis uh, approach of analyzing cellular network uh, protocol specification. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about Torpedo, which is an attack where uh, it uses side channel information to geographically locate a uh, user from the phone number only. And then we're gonna talk a, a little bit about defense and finally stop with uh, concluding remarks. So let's talk a little bit about background. Now, a cellular uh, connection enabled device uh, has uh, in its chip uh, has a baseband processor. So baseband processor is the one that uh, handles all the communication between the base station and the core network. So think of this as the protocol uh, is implemented inside that baseband processor. And so a device in the terminology of uh, cellular network is called UE, which stands for user equipment. Now, a user equipment has a device ID, which is called IMEI. And this stands for International Mobile 
equipment identity. This is a persistent identity analogous to MAC address. Uh, and a communication enabled device often uh, carries a SIM card and the SIM card has two persistent information. So one persistent information is a master cryptographic key. So this is needed when the phone wants to connect to the cone network uh, and it's presented with a cryptographic challenge. And the phone needs this uh, master cryptographic key to solve that challenge. So one of the thing is that, that this key never leaves the SIM card. So it doesn't go to the user land or so app land. And the other, other persistent identifier is called uh, IMSI. So it stands for International Mobile Subscriber Identity. So think of this as a unique identifier that identifies the SIM card, okay? For a cell phone uh, to communicate with the core network, it relies on a base station. So base stations are trusted intermediary. So think of them as they relay information from the cellular network to the cone network. In the terminology of cellular network, it's called E node B. And so each cell, uh, cell tower uh, powers a hexagonal area. And a bunch of them for administrative purpose is called a tracking area, okay? Then on the other hand side, you have the core network. Uh, which is called the evolved packet core. And it's made out of a bunch of uh, components. Uh, and so I, I have intentionally abstracted uh, the other ones uh, with other service nodes and focusing on particularly two ones. Uh, so the first one is called MME. So MME is called mobility management entity. So what this guy, takes care of is that it controls all the base station in a tracking area. That means it can actually track where the, which base station the user is connected to. So this comes in handy when you get a phone call, so it knows where to route that information to. Then you have the HFS, which stands for Home Subscriber Server. So this is essentially a database that contains all the credential information of the cell phone. Okay, so whenever the cell phone wants to connect, the HHS would present a challenge uh, that the cell phone needs to solve to be able to connect to the network. Now, we are gonna talk a, a little bit about 5G Reasoner, which is our analysis uh, platform uh, for testing 5G uh, protocol. So before I move on, are there any questions from the audience? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about 5G Reasoner. Uh, so before we talk about 5G Reasoner, we should talk about uh, impacts of 5G. So 5G is uh, the newest generation of the uh, cellular network protocol. Uh, so because of this uh, physical layer uh, improvements and technologies that enables higher bandwidth, lower latency connections, uh, 5G has been envisioned to be able to use for vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle communication, as well as newer applications like enabling remote surgery with uh, low latency. Now, there are other, other novel applications such as uh, situational awareness in a uh, battlefield. Uh, so this comes in handy because one can actually uh, build up a 5G network without a lot of trouble. And once the job is done, they can take it away. Uh, so think of this as a foldable base station. Now, in addition to these novel applications, uh, there are other improvements to 5G, particularly, so 5G aims to come up with a robust security posture over its predecessor, 4G LTE. So the question that we, ask is, is it possible to formally verify the design of 5G protocols uh, with respect to the promised security and privacy guarantees? So this is the research question that we are aiming to answer uh, in this work. Now, so why analyzing the design is important is that if design is flawed, uh, any implementation uh, that follows that design would 
end up uh, inheriting the same uh, issues. And additionally, because 5G has not been fully uh, deployed yet, if we can find issues uh, in this specification, we can actually uh, stop uh, attacks before the 5G gets fully deployed, okay? Now, to achieve this, there are multiple challenges. So the first challenge is there are no formal specification. So the specification of the pro protocol is distributed in multiple documents and it's pretty large. And what makes it more hard is that uh, there are different revisions of the standard as well as uh, there are a lot of jargons that's, that I have already mentioned like MME, HHS, which makes it hard to actually uh, go through and get a complete picture of the protocol. Then there is protocol complexity by itself. Uh, so the software, uh, the network stack is multi-layer and at each layer, there are multiple protocols that are running side by side and some of them interact with each other. In addition, uh, they use cryptography. Uh, so all of this together makes it really challenging to analyze the protocol uh, in a uniform fashion. Finally, uh, this is a more pragmatic issue uh, where uh, it's hard to obtain requirements. Uh, let's see, I think we have a question. Do we have a question? No. Yeah, this is Clement speaking. Sorry to interrupt. It's just by no. curiosity. You said there's no formal specification, mm -hmm. but you kind of, you are trying to work one out, if I understand mm -hmm. correctly. And I was curious to know if that pseudo formal specification was uniform across the globe, or like if there was differences between how 5G was implemented in the US and in UK and in other places of the world. Uh, that's a really good question, uh, Clement. So one of the issue is that, so the, the formal specific, uh, the specification of the standard specification is fairly uh, abstract. So it leaves uh, certain uh, gaps to be filled by the deployment. So even though uh, it's a uniform uh, specification, but there are holes in it that may rely, rely on the, uh, what do you call the de deployment itself? Okay, so I guess you can interpret it in different ways. Yes, and okay. the, in many cases, that is the problem. Yeah, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, finally, uh, we, we have the, let's assume we have a formal uh, model, but we need some requirements to actually analyze that with. Believe it or not, containing this uh, requirement is extremely hard because this is not explicit anywhere. This is somewhat implicit in all the description. And so there's a lot of manual work uh, that goes under to actually carry this kind of work. So because 5G is extremely large, so we wanted to kind of scope the problem in a manageable fashion. So what we did was first uh, talked about three participants. So the UE, which is the phone, the base station, and the network. So if you see the network aspect, so there are multiple components that we have mashed together into one component, which is, we're calling it the abstract network. And I have hinted that uh, the protocol stack has multiple layers. Uh, so we are focusing on the top two uh, because those are the control plane protocol where, which enables you to set up connection and uh, do other management uh, activities. And any mistake there would mean any subsequent uh, connection would be problematic. Now, the question is, given this uh, abstract uh, description, how do we go to model? So very high level. So this is what we do. So we assume that uh, there are two layers uh, in the cell phone, NAS and the RRC, and they talk to each other on a private channel. And the RRC layer of the base station and the NAS layer of the network talks in the, again, in a secure channel. The only channel that is problematic is the connection between the two RRC channels, between the phone and the base station. So this is where the attacker can uh, reside. So we uh, abstract uh, the protocol behavior uh, on a as a finite state machine, okay? And uh, we have bi-directional channels uh, 
uh, instead of like two unidirectional channels instead of a bidirectional channel to avoid multiplexing and demultiplexing issues. So this is just modeling convenience. And we assume that there is an adversary who sits between these two uh, channels uh, between the cell phone and the base station. Okay. And the adversary's behavior is again captured as a state machine. Now, if you see here, there is a lot of state machine going, uh, going on. Uh, on top of that, there are aspects to, to the modeling that is, if not carefully done, would have create state expl uh, space explosion. What it means is that you would have way too many states to analyze uh, with your reasoning engine. So, so the first uh, aspect is some of the state transitions are payload dependent. Then you have different timers with different gran granularity. So like say some could be 30 seconds, some could be 60 seconds, okay? Now, what we do is we actually use predicate abstraction to capture this uh, data and packet payload sort of conditions. For instance, we have uh, predicates like a validity predicate that tells you whether the message authentication code you received in your uh, message is actually valid or not, okay? Then uh, say whether a payload contains a particular temporary uh, identifier, uh, identified as TMSI, uh, and again, it's like a presence predicate. And then you have a grouping predicate that groups different uh, granular, uh, different fine grain stuff to more abstract classes. Now, so think about the first case where if you did not have a, a like validity predicate for Mac, if you were to analyze uh, bits of Mac, that would be way too expensive. So all of this is to try to uh, decrease the search space of finding bad behavior. And for timers, what we have is uh, for each timer, we have a predicate called timer st uh, started uh, and a timer expired. And to actually figure out whether a timer is running, you just say a timer started and it has not expired, okay? So in this way, we do not need to capture the resolution of the clock. Uh, we don't have to capture each tick of the clock. We just need to know whether the timer started, expired, or is running. Now, for adversary, or what kind of adversary uh, are we going to consider? So we consider the dollar VR adversary. This is a very typical adversary for cryptographic protocol verification. And for this uh, case, uh, this works very well due to the following fact. It's a lot of the dollar VR adversary capabilities can be actually mimicked in real life. Uh, for cellular network. So this is a right uh, uh, adversary model. So question is, what can the adversary do in this model? So adversary's action is treated as an environment variable that is open. You don't know what it does. Uh, so it non-deterministically chooses, excuse me, between a bunch of actions. So the first action is drop message. So if the UE sends a message, the adversary may decide non-deterministically to drop the message or even modify the message uh, or perform an impersonation attack. Say here it's impersonating the actual legitimate network. Now, all of this uh, should be done with respect to the cryptographic assumption. So what I mean by this is that you are modifying a message. Say for instance, that's one of the capabilities. If, you, if it's cryptographically protected through message authentication code and encryption, uh, and you do not have the keys, then you cannot tamper with it. So you can tamper with only messages that you have somehow control over. Now, so what is the key inside of our adversarial testing framework? So the, once we analyze the different properties we want to uh, satisfy, we realize that a lot of them are temporal ordering of, of events that is trace, uh, trace properties. And also there are cryptographic constructs, as I mentioned, because you're using encryption, uh, message authentication codes. And then there are these uh, linear integer arithmetic and other predicates that are uh, included here. This is for example, one where we are saying that the sequence, num the expected sequence number is within a range. So this is to protect against replay attacks. Now the intuition is that uh, model checkers are very good at uh, 
temple trace property analysis or analyzing linear integer arithmetic, uh, particularly uh, when you have infinite st uh, state model checkers. <coughs> Excuse me. On the other hand, when you have cryptography protocol verifiers, they are very good at reasoning about uh, cryptographic constructs. Now, the question that we asked is that how can we leverage the reasoning power of both of these to reason about properties then can talk about temporal ordering of events and also cryptography. So we went to the, the most uh, intuitive approach of uh, counter example guided abstract refinement. I'll, I'll talk about it in a bit. So in the 5G reasoner framework, uh, we manually go over the technical specification and uh, you generate an abstract cellular protocol model. Here, remember that because we are abstracting, we do not consider any cryptographic constructs. Cryptographic constructs are, uh, cryptographic constructs are replaced by their, uh, their uh, plain text counterpart. And then we have, an, so one takes this model and we have this instrumenter that instruments this uh, model automatically to include the adversary. So what you end up getting is an adversary instrumented model. Uh, and then from the technical specification, uh, you get the desired property as well as there are some uh, technical requirements and conformance test suits that we generate uh, properties. We get around 160 properties and the property and the instrumented model is fed into a model checker. So what a model checker does is it checks all the executions of that instrumented model and tries to find one execution uh, which violates the desired property you're trying to uh, verify. Now, there could be multiple cases. So one case would be that the property is satisfied. In this case, we are good, okay? Uh, I'll come back to it in a bit, why this is fine. But if you have a counter example, so there could be two possible cases. So one possible case is that uh, this is a spurious counter example because you did not uh, include the cryptographic constructs. Uh, and this was a mistake because of this. And the adversary ended up uh, injecting a message that in real life he couldn't have given the cryptographic requirements. So for that, what we need to do is like take this counter example and actually fed it into uh, generate the appropriate query and feed it into a cryptographic protocol verifier. Now, the beauty of this, this is a single linear uh, execution. There are no branches. So analyzing it is easier than actually the real protocol when you have multiple branches. Now, again, there are two cases. If there are no attacks, that means it was a mistake. So we add an invariant uh, to the property so that that aspect is never considered uh, so that you do not see that uh, behavior ever again. And in other case, this is actually a real attack, then you provide that attack steps. Now, remember I mentioned, I will come back to the property satisfied that if the model checker says it's good, why it's good. So the reason behind it is that without the cryptographic restriction, the, the adversary is actually more powerful than the real adversary. So if you cannot find an attack against a powerful uh, adversary, you, it's, you know that you're not gonna find an attack on a more restricted adversary. So as a result of which, when the model checker says the property is satisfied, you can stop. So to summarize the findings uh, we have, so we found 11 new attacks uh, in the 5G uh, specification and five of them were inherited attacks. So, so this, the five attacks were something that uh, they inherited from 4G. So a lot of the protocol behavior of 5G is actually similar to 4G. So as a result of which they inherited some of these attacks. And so this is the breakdown of the attacks. Uh, for five we got uh, for NAS layer, four for RRC, and two on the cross layer behavior. And some of the implications include overbilling, location tracking, uh, identifier exposure, service profiling, denial of service, and energy depletion. Okay, so I'll give you one example. So before I start off, uh, I would like to point you to the, uh, the term TMSI. So TMSI is actually a temporary identifier that is assigned to the 
phone during initial registration. Because as I mentioned, the per persistent ones are once exposed can be misused. So this way you actually expose uh, just a temporary one that you change intermittently. And for this attack to happen, uh, there is a adversary has to have a cell phone. Uh, he has to know the victim's phone number and he needs to know somehow where the victim is. And then you put on a sniffer and a base station. So what ends up happening is that uh, when the base station says release the connection because there is no activity, you interrupt that message. You don't let it go. So what ends up happening is that when the adversary uh, adversary calls. So for the perspective of the base station, the phone is idle, whereas the phone is actually connected. Phone thinks it's connected. So what ends up happening is the, uh, the adversary cell phone would call the victim. And the, because the victim, according to the base station is idle, the enemy would say, go wake up the victim because he has a phone call. And what would happen is the victim would uh, receive this paging message with TMZ. The issue is that in the connected mode, uh, the phone doesn't actually look for this message to begin with. So, and the sniffer would then keep sniffing uh, when the time expires, it would keep sending this paging message. And then you can figure out what is the TMZ of this uh, phone, and then you can launch other attacks. So this is just a, a very high level attack uh, we do, but this is often the first step to carry out more devastating attacks. So we did, yes, okay. Kevin. Yes, sorry, I have another question. So you said yes. you found an array of uh, possible attacks, mm -hmm. but then I'm curious because to me, when I hear attack, there's always the, what is three lines of code and an update fix. And on the other end of the spectrum, it's like spectra where it's like, well, we can fix it. Like we just have to release a new hardware and everything. Mm -hmm. What's the ratio on the attack you identified between the one where it's just like literally three lines of code and the one that are like, we don't know how to fix them. So or it's like, you have to change the hardware. It's 90-10. 90% of the attacks are like two lines of code. 10% of them are protocol val problems. Yeah. And I'll show you one in a bit. Okay, thank you. One more attack in a bit. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, we, we responsibly disclosed this uh, attacks to the 3GPP, which is the standards body of this. And so as uh, uh, Harley mentioned, uh, we, we were inducted to the uh, Hall of Fame because we found these bugs. Uh, so next, uh, the question that we, I would like to ask is, can this model uh, that we, or the adversarial framework we came up with, uh, find all kinds of attacks? The answer is actually no. So for, I have actually given you a hint before. So I mentioned that most of the attacks that we can identify are trace properties. Trace properties are talking about one execution of the system. But there are cases when you have to talk about multiple execution of the system. An example would be side channel uh, attacks. Uh, so there are these properties called non-interference properties, which for which you need to actually talk about pair of uh, pair of uh, executions, not a single execution of the protocol. So torpedo is one such attack. Uh, and so we are particularly attacked this paging protocol. And we showed that the description of the way it was designed, the protocol was wrong, okay? Now let's start talking about what is the objective of this attack. The objective of the attack is to identify or verify uh, a user's presence on a geographical area. And in addition to it, partially leak the IMSI, which is the SIM card specific uh, persistent identifier. Now, so essentially what we want to know is whether a particular user is in a geographical area or not. Now, so a little background of what is a paging protocol. So when your phone is uh, talking with uh, or doing some activity, it's connected to the network, uh, specifically the base station. Now, when you are not active, uh, what ends up happening is that if you're still connected, you'll run out of battery because 
sending in and out of uh, sending packets is one of the most uh, expensive operation with respect to uh, battery power. So there should be a way to somewhat uh, decrease the, uh, the battery consumption. And so what ends up happening is that whenever uh, your phone goes to uh, silent uh, for some certain amount of time, there is no network activity, you switch off the cellular modem. That means you do not hear for any messages. Now, what ends up happening is that what if, uh, so what is this protocol trying to do? So this protocol is trying to balance between battery and service. So this is what we are trying to do that when you don't, don't have any service, you just switch off the radio, uh, radio. Now, what happens if you receive a call? So when you receive a call, uh, what ends up happening is that a message is sent to the base station that I wanna call this person, and that gets routed to the core network until the last place you, you were there. And then that message is sent to the phone and the phone, receive this notification, okay. Now, what ends up happening is that, uh, as I mentioned, the, fo the phone is sleeping. So when should I send the message, right? Because if I send the message when it's sleeping, it's not gonna receive the message because the radio is off. And what should be in the message that the phone knows that it has a, a, a waiting service request? So for this, what ends up happening is the paging protocol partitions the time on this uh, unit cells, each of which is like around 10 milliseconds. So it has like 128 such things that wraps around, okay? And so this is often called paging occasion. Uh, that is, among this time, there is a particular point the phone keeps waking up periodically. Say in this example, it's the third slot from the left, right? This is when the phone wakes up. Every uh, third slot, it wakes up. Now, uh, so how is this uh, slot assigned? So this slot is assigned just by taking the mod of uh, IMSI number on 128. So whatever, wherever your IMSI falls, uh, that's the slot you'll wake up. And if you, like squint at it carefully. Yeah. IMSI is a persistent number, right? So that means <clears throat> as long as you have that SIM card, your SIM card would wake up in that particular slot, okay? So what this means is that when it's sleeping in this time, if you send a message, the message is just gonna, not gonna be received. It's the same thing for the other cases. Only when it's awake, if you send a message that it will receive the message, okay? The next question is uh, we asked is what is inside this uh, message? So what is inside this message is, uh, let's see. Yeah, so it's, a, it's essentially a 16 pairs. At, uh, so each pair, the first one tells you the identity of the phone for which the message, there is an awaiting message. So PS means packet switch. This is for the LTE and CS is for a circuit switch, which is for 3G and below, okay? So as I mentioned, identifier can be temporary one or even the permanent one, okay? Now, one of the thing is that normally we do not know uh, what a, when a victim's phone would wake up, okay? If I somehow figured that out, one of the advantage is that I would not only be able to track every time whether the user is in a particular location, but also I will leak the last seven bits of the IMSI number, okay? Uh, so let's go forward with this. So one of the thing is that uh, when you send a, when you call to, when you actually receive the message, there is a actually a time window uh, that uh, it, there is a delay. So it's not instantaneous, right? you call and I don't receive a notification. It's not instantaneous. So what the attacker has to do is essentially measure this time. So if, and do this uh, multiple times is that when I call to when I receive a message, so what is the gap? Okay. So, and additionally, 
So these messages are broadcast messages. That means it's sent over the air. So there, there is nobody stopping an adversary to get a copy of those messages and establish a sniffer. So what would the adversary do is like keep calling uh, and then just keep receiving which slots got a call, right? Now, there are ways to actually make this call just ring short enough so that there is no missed call in the victim's phone, okay? So what ends up happening is that whenever a message is uh, received, so a base station, uh, a sniffer would actually receive that message too. Now, what we do essentially is that for each of the slots, we carry out what is the expected number of paging messages for each slot, okay? So without any attack, this is what it looks like. So, but when you start attacking, you keep calling, especially the torpedo attack, you will see that there is this one slot where the expectation got like jumped up really high. And because you are the one who's calling, uh, so you, you can realize that that is the victim's paging occasion. And you can use that information to get the last seven, which are IMSI. Uh, we actually showed how to break an IMC, uh, like IMSI, using a brute force attack with an Oracle. But for the interest of time, I'm gonna skip this. So I talked about uh, 5G Reasoner, which uh, is the analysis framework. Then I talked a little bit about Torpedo, uh, which is a particular attack that allows you to want to actually locate uh, or verify the presence of a, a user in a particular geographical area, as long as the adversary has a sniffer in that area and the adversary knows the uh, victim's phone number. As it turns out, actually for torpedo attack, as long as the victim's phone is connected to the network, uh, cellular network, not Wi-Fi, uh, this can be carried out with other kind of apps. Uh, so instance, uh, Twitter. So if you get a Twitter notification, uh, if you have a push notification on, you can carry out the attack on that way too. Now, uh, I've talked about attacks and analysis. Now, I want to talk a little bit about defense. So particularly, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, using a public key infrastructure on LTE. So this is a, this is a work we called Insecure connection bootstrapping in cellular networks. It was published in YSAC 19. So, for people who are not familiar with this, so what we have, what is a public infrastructure is that uh, it's a hierarchy of trusted parties, starting with some root level CA stands for certificate authority, uh, which bestows its trust to some intermediate level CAs who in turn can do it for other intermediate level CAs. Now, so each CA has a certificate. A certificate is nothing but a public key and a identity binding, okay? So, so the root level certificates uh, are signed by itself, by own uh, private key. But for the way you bestow trust is by signing the certificate of uh, using Say this root level CA, the root level CA wants to do the uh, intermediate level CA on the left, they would sign uh, their certificate with the private key. And that's, that's, uh, that serves as the bestowing trust, okay? Uh, <clears throat> in a regular computer, these uh, root level CAs are installed as part of the operating system installation, as well as browser installation. Now, if your device wants to communicate to Google, what Google does is that Google gives you this chain, which proves that you are talking to Google, not somebody else pretending to be Google. And then one can actually check the signatures and other things along this chain. Uh, and using the root level CA, which is stored in its computer as the trust anchor, okay? So in that way, you can, validate that you're talking to Google. Now, so once we have talked about the public infrastructure, we wanted to talk a little bit about how does uh, a phone select and initiate a connection to the base station? 
say, for instance, uh, you have three base stations uh, who are uh, emitting signals uh, that we are, they are available for connection. And a phone uh, would essentially figure out which, uh, which base station actually uh, is the closest or giving the highest signal strength, as well as other configuration parameters. And say, for instance, this is the phone that it would, uh, base station it would connect to because this was providing the highest signal strength. So, so this is what it looks like. So the base station keeps emitting periodically this information called master information block. So this is used to actually time synchronize between the phone and the base station, okay? And once this is time synchronized, the next type of information tells you uh, which, uh, what other times the other system information block messages would be broadcasted. Particularly the type two is where all the configuration parameters are there to actually connect to the base station, okay? So the issue here is that there is no authentication uh, between the UE and the E0B, okay? That is, it just connects. And so nothing is stopping from uh, an adversary to set up a base station, which is mimicking the same uh, parameter as the one it's currently connected to and just emit the signal at a higher signal strength, okay? And then what would the phone do is like, it would disconnect from the uh, legitimate one and would connect to the uh, rogue base station. So this is as simple as that. And this is problematic because a lot of the attacks uh, that, that is in the literature and in practice uh, starts with uh, this step, including the Stingray. So this is what the string, Stingray uh, devices do. They lure the device to connect to the rogue base station. So how much time do I have, Harley? Uh, Looks like you still have uh, at least eight minutes, but if you need to go over slightly, it's no big deal. Okay, perfect, sorry. Yep. Thank you. So now what to applying the public key uh, infrastructure, uh, what we do is that we, let's take Verizon for an example, because that's what I use. So you'll generate keys and the, the certificate uh, and you will preload the SIM card uh, with the certificate of the Verizon. And then <clears throat> Verizon will, uh, like the base uh, MME would generate it key, its keys and the certificate as well as each base station. And so you would use Verizon's private key to sign the MME's certificate. And similarly, the MME would uh, sign it for the base station. So this is like a hierarchical uh, administration, okay? Because, uh, <clears throat> the base stations can come and go, but the core network is not likely gonna change. And whenever you receive an MIB, it, it is like a typical MIB message. But for SIB one information, along with its previous information, you would actually add a certificate, okay? So it's a needed certificate to uh, the chain I showed you uh, before. and. For SIB2 message, then what you would have is the replay protection as well as the signature, digital signature uh, that's sign, signed with the base station's uh, private key. Now, why this is necessary is due to the following fact that uh, this is, uh, why did we include both signature uh, in the same message? This is due to the following fact is that uh, we did not want to change the packet structure. So we were essentially using optional spaces that were left. And if you take a regular certificate, we had to actually come up with our own encoding that's efficient enough to fit in those uh, settings. And in this way, actually, uh, you can actually authenticate the base station and eradicate around 80% to 85% of the current attacks if you just did that. But uh, unfortunately, this is not done. Uh, and a lot of people said, uh, called our paper one of the best security 
papered in the cellular network area, which we were surprised by because public key infrastructure is an idea that's available from 1976, right? And so our main contributions were how would we do it without changing the protocol itself or, or not the packets also, okay? Now, so this is one line of defense that one can apply. And we have talked to FTC uh, and FCC uh, to actually uh, see whether this is viable to be deployed in practice. The issue is that when you roam, how would you get, uh, like your SIM card may not be equipped with uh, that the serving networks uh, like uh, root certificate. So, and this would require Verizon to sign for AT&T and certificate and AT&T to Verizon certificate. And this cross certificate uh, signing is something that is not very popular among their operators. Okay, so I, I will uh, go to the next stage where I think what needs to happen is we need to empower devices and owners to actually tell them whether there are actual attacks that are going on. Currently, this is not possible. For instance, your phone, if it uh, connect to a network that's not using any encryption, uh, you wouldn't even know. There is no sign like a lock, like a web browser, right? There's nothing. So I think users have a right to know about this sort of things. And the insight is that, so there is a, so there, for to build up this insight, we're gonna talk about one, two attacks. The first is the num attack that we came up with in a sense that uh, if you send this authentication reject message out of sequence, uh, this would uh, take the connectivity out of your phone. And as a result of which, uh, your phone would not be able to communicate anymore uh, until you take the SIM card out, okay? And you might say, okay, I can jam the signal. But the issue is when you jam the signal, you cannot make it targeted. This is a targeted denial of service attack. The other one is the RLF report where uh, the attack actually forces the device to actually release this RLF report, which contains the victim's GPS coordinates and other locations in plain text, okay? Uh, and this would leak the victim's uh, location. Now, all of this is actually, if you squint at it, are violations of temple safety properties. So what it means is for the first one, you sh should say that I should not receive authentication reject until I've seen a response. I mean, without I send, me sending you a response, how can you reject me, okay? And the other one is that uh, RLF reports should, not be, should never be broadcasted uh, when I've not set up uh, the security context. I've not set up the keys. You should not ask me to release this. Now for this, what we envision is uh, something like this, where whenever uh, any message sent and received by a seller or modem would be uh, fed to our monitor. And so what would happen is it's gonna analyze a bunch of attack signatures and your previous messages to say whether there is a problem or not, okay? And for this, Signature uh, attack signature, what you can do is essentially feed this signature synthesizer a bunch of attack traces and benign traces, and it would automatically generate a signature. So for the interest of time, I, I cannot talk about it this a lot. Uh, so what we need for this envision uh, workflow to work is actually we need an effective signature synthesizer that has a low false positive rate, because if you, bombard users with false positive, uh, they are not gonna use it. You need a way to actually efficiently and reliably extract messages from the modem. And then you actually have to monitor it without overload. That means you cannot have too much energy requirement or memory requirement. So an example would be say, uh, we want to say that if I'm receiving an authentication reject, that means I might I should receive a authentication response in the previous step. Otherwise there is something wrong. So in that case, if I say an attach request, this tells you I want to attack, uh, attach to the base station, then they would ask me a authentication challenge and I respond. 
and I reject. So according to this, this is fine because I received the reject after I have responded. But in many cases, uh, I have seen, uh, we have seen that uh, phones would uh, cannot process this authentication reject out of order. And this would trigger our attack signature. And then you can raise a warning. Now, so, so what you could do is if we have modem support, uh, we would just not accept authentication reject message. But without modem support, which we do not have right now, that means uh, we cannot enforce this monitor uh, or put this deploy this monitor inside our modem. We can just uh, warn the user and recommend basic remedies. There are other applications of this, for instance, as honeypot or even say, for instance, installing it uh, inside the modems to not have problems. So I'll, I'll stop with a, a demo. Uh, let's see. So this is the NAM attack demo uh, based on our system. Uh, and so uh, the top two are the malicious network and the base station and the bottom two are the benign network. So these are uh, software stack, but sending with uh, software defined radios. So if you see right now, uh, the attack is gonna happen. Uh, so our uh, Phoenix monitor detects it. It says there is a NUM attack. He's very confident. And the remedy is reinsert the SIM card or reboot the device. And if you do not do that, so we just uh, switched off the uh, malicious base station. We switched on the B9 ones. And what would happen is that your phone is not connected. Right, yeah. you can do uh, back and forth of airplane mode. It's not going to connect uh, until you actually end up uh, rebooting the phone or reinserting the SIM card. So once you reinsert the SIM card, uh, you can then uh, take off airplane mode, and you will see the phone would get connected to the network. So that is all. So all of this work can, wouldn't have been able to, we couldn't have done it without a lot of our collaborators and students from Purdue, Penn State, uh, Dartmouth, and Iowa. So with that, I'd like to conclude and answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Omar. <clears throat> First off, I really enjoyed your slides. I thought they were really well put together and different animations and stuff. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have any questions before we uh, conclude? So I just wondered, um, it was, it's kind of a minor thing. What exactly is the obstacle to deploying that public key infrastructure um, on the, cell towers and base stations? Okay, so that's a good question. So a lot of this is that <clears throat> if your solution works in one particular corner, they, they have a tendency of uh, not accepting that. So it has to work in multiple scenarios. One, examples would be, uh, one example would be, say, you're, when you're roaming, you have a phone uh, that you are going to, you have a Verizon SIM card, and you're going to travel to London. And there, you somehow have to, you want to connect to the base station of, say, three or Vodafone, uh, which are the partners of uh, Verizon. Now, to connect, to uh, authenticate the base station, you need the root certificate of either Vodafone or three. Neither you have in your SIM card. So how would you get that SIM card information? So one possibility would be to ask Verizon to sign certificates of uh, Vodafone uh, or three, but oftentimes uh, people are ambivalent about uh, connecting, uh, like cross-signing each other's certificate. So this is just a trust issue. This is not technical per se. Okay, does that answer your question? 
And is there a technical limitation that prevents you from just having all the root certificates on the SIM card, like we currently do with browsers, where you, you come preloaded with hundreds of root certificates? It's ex extremely, so one of the issue is that base stations, right? Uh, it's memory is a requirement. Uh, so it, like storing it in the SIM card is not a, not feasible, like hundreds of uh, certificates. Uh, so one, <clears throat> one possibility that we have talked about in the paper is eSIM cards where you can over the air load information. But uh, again, if you op expose that interface, bad things generally happen. People miss, like cannot implement things correctly. And so, yeah, it's for me, it's, uh, we couldn't uh, come up with a legitimate answer to how would we solve uh, roaming. That's, that's, let's call it that way. So there wasn't a satisfactory way we could come up with that was safe enough to actually handle roaming. And uh, adding, having all of their certificate was uh, not an option. Okay, well, uh, thanks. Thanks for the extra detail. Okay, absolutely. Other questions? Clément, yeah. did you have a question, I think? Yeah, a quick question about maybe the operating system. So the example you show us, you are apparently using Android. Mm -hmm. I was curious to know if uh, you try to experiment both with like closed source operating system, like the one from Windows, that kind of thing, or with open source, more open source, I should say, because Android is supposedly open source, but with more open source yeah. operating systems as well. Or you're really focusing on Android right now because it's like 80 something percent of the market anyway. Uh, so a, a little bit of both, uh, honestly. So the issue is that receiving uh, information from modem uh, without routing the device is just not feasible right now. And uh, so this is feasible in uh, Android specifically. There are this uh, software called, uh, there are multiple softwares uh, actually that allows you to get that information with a DIAC protocol. So there is a USB uh, diagnostic port that you can uh, open and read, read from. And this is not that easy on other platforms like iPhones or iOS. I mean, so what our hope is that we show its effectiveness with Android so that other people try to somewhat expose that as a permission. Say for instance, an app can seek for a permission to actually access that information. And in that way, that is one way to do it. Uh, but our end game is actually try to inspired the modem developers to actually incorporate this directly in there. So that if you think about the state machine uh, analogy, before taking a transition, you consult this monitor saying that, is it validating any of this? If validating any of this, then I'm just gonna ignore. Otherwise I'm gonna take that action. So that's, that's the end game for us. Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, so the operating system is really just a tool for you to actually look at the modem. That's what you're trying right, to do. Right, exactly, okay. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, please. Can you talk a little bit more about the abstractions that you use to get around state explosion? Okay, so, uh, sure. So one of the few things we, we had to do to get around is that we had to uh, say, for instance, uh, rather than actually talking about payload, because if you think about the transitions, uh, tr transitions conditions are essentially predicates over those payloads. So I, if I ca captured yeah. that uh, predicates, that's good enough. So this is essentially what we did we try to figure out what predicates are needed to actually uh, capture the transitions precisely so that uh, without actually talking about the data itself. And uh, so, so I just talked a little bit about the 5G stuff. So we did the same thing for 4G, which is called the LTE inspector. And there we had uh, soft, we tested out on software defined radios and uh, like our test bed to actually see that the attack actually happens. And so for 5G, that this is hard. Uh, so yeah, I mean, 
So we needed to do uh, abstraction on the payload uh, and there are these timers that we needed to abstract away. Okay, so those are the main main abstraction and we use predicate abstractions essentially. Right, so, and data independence because the, the data in the payload doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect the control. Mm -hmm. yes. And then uh, predicate abstraction, abstract each predicate to a Boolean. Right, yes. Yeah, it, so right. The, 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 the graph and hurry the uh, uh, technique. Right. Yeah. So I mean, uh, so yeah. what we needed. Uh, so so something I dusted under the rug is that we actually needed to uh, do some in addition to predicate abstractions to maintain that we don't see spurious behavior. Uh, we needed to add invariance to make right. sure that uh, say for instance, I don't want my timer to start and end at the same state. It's either yeah. would start or end. So like right. a mutual exclusion uh, invariant. So there are different sort of invariants we needed to add to make sure the uh, predicate abstractions, even though they are coarse, uh, with They're these invariants. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's tight enough. respect the reachable states to. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions, folks? All right, that looks like uh, maybe we're all finished. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Omar. I really enjoyed your, your talk and- uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. This Friday, everybody. even though we've all definitely been uh, busy refreshing our election sites, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> good luck, everybody. Have have a Thank good one. So Stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, Amal. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye.